Hello, welcome back to Algebra. We're going to switch gears a little bit. The title of this lesson is called Solving Polynomial Equations Part 1. We have several parts here. Now, we spent the last five lessons learning how to factor polynomials, factor quadratic polynomials, which means we have an x squared term in there somewhere. And I kept telling you over and over again that it's important, just trust me, just trust me, it's important. So we did a lot of problems on different cases of how to factor things, right? Here we're finally going to learn why we care about that. And the truth is, to, to figure out why we really care, is because lots of equations in real life, lots of equations in electricity, in magnetism, a lot of equations in motion, motion of, of trajectory through the air, rockets, rockets flying through the air, lots of things, orbital mechanics, have lots of terms that are quadratic like that. They have x squares running around. So solving equations that involve x, you know, terms that have x squares, polynomials with quadratic terms like that, is really, really, really common and really important. It's a huge branch of mathematics. So now we learned how to do the factoring of those, and now we're going to learn why. So before we get there, before we get to the solving of the quadratic uh, uh, equations like that, the, the polynomials, I want to talk to you about the concept of graphs and the concept of functions and how they relate to the concept of what we call the root of a function. A lot of times in algebra you'll be told, find the roots of this equation, find the roots of this. Sometimes you'll be told, find the zeros of this, find the zeros of that function. So I want to talk to you about what that means. First of all, when you're asked to find the roots of something, it's exactly the same thing as when they ask you to find the zeros of something. So if they say, find the roots of this polynomial, it's exactly the same thing as find the zeros of this polynomial. Those two things mean really the same thing. So if you see on one book, roots, and another thing, you see find the zeros, they're asking you the same thing. What are they asking you? They're basically asking you, where does this graph cross the x-axis? Where does the graph cross the x-axis? That's what's called the roots of the function, also called the zeros of the function. I'll explain why those, those definitions make sense in just a second. Before we get to the roots and the zeros of quadratics, which is what we really care about, I want to talk to you about lines, because we talked about lines a lot. So here's the big picture. If you have a function of x, let's pick an easy line, 2x plus 4. First of all, how do we know it's a line? Because it, there's no square terms. If it had an x squared, it'd be a, it'd be a quadratic, like what we're going to talk about in a minute. But this is mx plus b. Those are the, the, the standard form of a line. So I'm not going to graph this particular one just yet. I am going to graph it in a second. But in general, you know lines can have any y-intercept, and they can also have any slope. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not caring about accuracy here. I'm just telling you, in general, lines can look all different directions. As long as they're a straight line, they can look like this. They might be steeper, they look like this. They might actually slant the other way and look like this. They actually might be horizontal and never cross the x-axis. But anyway, they can go all different directions, right? And you all know that this is the x-axis, and this is, we used to call it the y-axis, now we say it's f of x. It's a function of x. We take numbers and stick them into the x, calculate the value of f of x, and we plot those points and we get these lines. Now, you can see that the horizontal line never ever crosses the x-axis. Right? But all of the other lines always cross the x-axis somewhere. They have to, because unless the line is flat, it has to have some tilt to it some sort of way, and if it ever has any tilt at all, it will eventually hit the x-axis. All right. So when we say that this function hits the x-axis, we call it the zero or the root. Let me talk about the, the term zero. We call it a zero of this function because it, it would be the value here where the function f of x is equal to zero. This is the value where it crosses the x-axis. If we put the value of x in here, then we calculate it, and the value we get out is at f of x is equal to zero. That's what it means to cross the x-axis. It means we find the place where the function itself has a value of zero. Because how far up and down? This is the f of x axis. So here, f of x is zero. It just crosses right there. For this line, here at this point, f of x is 0 because it crosses right there. For here, at this point, f of x is 0 there. So oftentimes in engineering and science and math, we want to know where the function crosses the x-axis. It's too much to explain now without getting into a lot of, 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 of real examples of real problems, which we'll get to at some point in the future. But for now, just know that finding when an equation equals 0 is very, very common. Maybe you're calculating the loads on a bridge. Maybe you want to figure out how much the bridge is twisting, and you want to figure out where the load is zero. Maybe you want to figure out where there's zero twisting. 
Maybe you want to figure out where there's a, a, a minimum point of, of bending or something like that in a beam, and you want to then find where the function equals zero because that's maybe the minimum stress point or something like that. But anyway, there's many, many cases, and a lot of cases in calculus later, when you're always going to want to figure out where some function is equal to zero. And that thing is called a zero because it crosses the x-axis, which means the value of the function f of x is zero here, here, and here. Of course, some lines never cross, and they don't have any zeros there. Now, synonymous with the word zero is the word root. Most of the time, it'll say, find the roots of the polynomial, find the roots of this line, find the roots of this equation. And in your mind, you need to translate that, that that means they want to know where it crosses the x-axis, which is where the zeros are. Same exact thing, different wording. So if I gave you one of these lines, like this one, I could graph it, of course. I could show exactly where this line crosses the axis. But what if I just wanted to calculate it without graphing it? Well, what I'm telling you is that this function has a zero where f of x is equal to zero, right? So what I'm saying is I want to figure out where along x this line has a place where the f of x, where the y value, for lack of a better word, is equal to zero. So I can stick a zero in there and figure out where that happens. How do I do it? I stick a zero over here and I solve for x. Well, if I move the four over, I'll have a negative four. That's equal to two x. And then to get x by itself, it'll just be negative four over two. You all know that, which means that x is equal to negative two. So what this means is that for this particular line, if we were to graph it, it should cross the x-axis at a location somewhere over here. x is equal to negative 2. Now, without drawing it, I don't know if the line is steep like this, backwards, forwards. I have no idea. All I really know is that it crosses the x-axis here. Because at this point is the point where f of x is 0. You can stick it back in there. Negative 2 gives you negative 4. Add this, you get 0. So at that point, the function is 0. So just to prove that to you for this one case, let's go ahead and graph this one line. And I'm doing it freehand, so forgive me, but I'm, it should come out pretty close, right? So mx plus b, that means the y-intercept is 1, 2, 3, 4. Y-intercept is right there. So I will grab another color, and I'll stick the y-intercept up here at 4. The slope of this line is positive 2. That means up 2 over 1. So up 2 and over 1. So up 2 from here over 1 means I should have a point somewhere around here. So I cannot do this expertly. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But let me, let me draw a few more tick lines to, to see how things go like this. And I will do the best that I can to draw a line through these points, which I've plotted. And it should look something like this. Now, I know it's freehand. But you can see, where does this line cross the x-axis? It crosses right here at x is equal to negative 2. In fact, you can see the spacing of my tick marks is not quite right. So this tick mark should be a little bit over there. But anyway, you can see it's at x is equal to negative 2. So the bottom line is I'm showing you by a graph that what we mean by zeros of a function or roots of a function, same thing, is just taking that function and setting it equal to 0. That means we're finding the value of x where the line crosses the x-axis. And you're just going to have to trust me for now that the equations of this type is extremely important in all branches of science and math, right? So we set it equal to 0. We solve for x. All right? Now, that's lines. Lines are great. They have their place. But lots of times we have equations with equa we have functions that are more complicated than a line. What other type of functions exist? We did a whole lesson on functions before. We talked about different kinds of functions. We'll review a little bit of that now because ultimately we're going to be solving and finding the roots of where these functions cross the x-axis. The most important function other than a line that you will ever encounter is what we call the parabola. The parabola obviously is not a line. It just goes down and it goes up or it can go upside down. Looks like a frowny face, right? So it's either a smiley face or it's a frowny face, right? And all parabolas look like this. So I can say with certainty over here, I can say all parabolas look like this. In order for a function to be a parabola, it must look something like one of these functions. It'll look like f of x is equal to x squared. That's a simple parabola. How do you know? Because it's a square term. This can never be a line because lines don't have squares. Lines just have a first power. Parabolas always have a second power. But you can have more complicated functions that describe a parabola. Just a few examples, x squared plus 2, that's a parabola. Doesn't matter that there's something added onto it. The fact that it has a square term means that it is a parabola, right? 
f of x can also be a little more complicated, x squared plus 3x minus 4. Doesn't matter that you have a 3x term and a 4 here, the only thing that matters is that there is a square here, uh, that the highest power of x is a square, which means it will look like a parabola when you graph it. You can also have more complicated ones. Uh, for instance, you can have a negative out in front, or even another number out in front of the x squared term, uh, plus 2x uh, plus 3. So I'm not going to graph all of these exactly, but if you were to put them into a calculator or just feed in numbers for x and calculate f of x, every one of these would look like a parabola of some type or another. It would be either smiley face like this or frowny face, and its location on the xy plane would be different depending on the exact numbers you pick. Now I don't want to get into it yet because we're going to get there, but I want to call your attention to these last two. These are trinomials, right? This is exactly what we have spent the last five lessons learning how to factor. So now you know how to factor these trinomials, and now you know that to find the roots or the crossings of, of functions, all you have to do is set the function equal to zero and then solve it. And you're just gonna have to trust me, but in a few minutes we're gonna learn that factoring these things is the key to being able to set this thing equal to zero and solve it, which is gonna figure out where these parabolas cross the x-axis. But if you think about it, a line only crosses the x-axis in one location because it's a line. It can only cross one place. But if you have a function like a parabola that goes down and back up, most of the time it crosses the axis in two locations. Most of the time. The x-axis, I mean. So let's look at a couple of examples like that. Let me see how much room I have because I have a lot of stuff to cover. Yeah, I think I have room. So let's go and let's take a look at it over here. Let's look at parabolas over here and how they could possibly cross the x-axis, right? There's a lot of different choices, right? But most of the time, a parabola, for instance, would cross like down here and then come back up. In that case, there would be two what we call roots. Whereas the line only had one root, the parabola could in most cases have two roots. It would cross the x-axis here and it would cross the x-axis here. These are both values where the parabola equals zero. Just like the line equals zero, we set it equal to zero, we're gonna end up setting this parabola equal to zero and figuring out where these two points are, right? To set it equal to zero. But we can also have cases where we can have a parabola cross maybe right here, and that would give me two crossing points as well. The parabola might be upside down, depending on the exact numbers we pick, might be upside down, but it would still cross in two locations. The parabola also could, I could draw it up or down, but I could actually draw it maybe like this, where there's, it just peaks up over the axis just a little bit, but there's still two crossing points, but they're closer together, right? The parabola could do that. And then here's the crazy part we're gonna get into much later in algebra. The parabola might actually look something like this, that's not even crossing an axis at all. Notice that, well, I would cross the y-axis, but I'm talking about it crossing the x-axis down here. The parabola might actually dip down and never cross the axis um, at all. But we have to talk about one more thing before we can actually calculate the roots of these things. And that is, notice that this parabola crosses in two places. This parabola crosses in two places. This parabola crosses in two places. This one, the red one, doesn't cross in any place at all. That's a special case. We're going to deal with that much later in algebra. It has to do with imaginary numbers. We'll talk about imaginary numbers later. There are no roots here, so we have imaginary numbers to deal with later on down the road. So forget about that one for now. Just remember that we're going to come back to that. But most of these parabolas cross in two locations. Notice that these equations all have the highest power of two. All of these parabolas always, 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 always have the highest power of what we call x squared. They're always quadratic. They always look like parabolas. Sometimes they're upside down, sometimes they're frowny face, sometimes they're smaller, sometimes they're shifted, but they always have a highest power of x squared. And notice that if you set these parabolas equal to zero to figure out their zeros, they cross in two locations here, cross in two locations here, cross in two locations here. So the rule of thumb I want you to keep in mind is that parabolas, because they have x squared as their highest term, you should always expect there to be two crossings of the x-axis, two solutions. So in general, this is the punchline, I need you to remember this, in general, when any polynomial that you have, if it's x squared, you should expect it to have two solutions when you set it equal to zero, meaning two crossing points. If you have a higher polynomial, for instance, x cubed, then 
that's going to look different than this, right? But it follows the same pattern. You should expect three crossing points for a cubic polynomial, three solutions, three roots, three zeros, whatever word you want to use. If you have an x to the fourth polynomial with the highest power is x to the fourth, you, sh you should expect four solutions. You see the pattern? If you have something with x to the tenth, which is crazy, we'll never do that, but if you had x to the tenth for their highest power polynomial, you would expect that thing to wiggle all over the place and cross ten different times, right? Potentially. So that's the thing I want to draw to your uh, attention because as you solve these things, you should expect two solutions for this, two solutions for this, two solutions for this, two solutions for this, corresponding to crossing point, two solutions, crossing point, two solutions, crossing point, two solutions. Now, I had to get all of that out because there's a special case. What if you have this? What if you have the following? What if I'm going to draw a little x, y axis here? And let's say I'm not going to put the parabola here or here crossing here. What if the parabola comes down and barely kisses the x axis like this? Right? Let's say it crosses it, I don't know, x equal to 3. Doesn't matter. Could be any number. See, over here, there are two solutions corresponding to the two crossing points. Here, there are two solutions corresponding to the two crossing points. Same thing here. And I'm telling you that every polynomial that's a quadratic that's like this, because there's an x squared, you should expect two solutions. But what happens if it only crosses, it basically doesn't cross, it just kind of touches the axis in that one little tiny point? Isn't that only one solution? But doesn't that go against what I just told you? This thing is going to look like x squared plus something something. You should expect two solutions. But in the special case where it barely kisses here at x is equal to 3, what we actually call this in that case is a double root. In other words, even though the, the function only touches the x-axis at one location, because we know it's a polynomial, an x-squared type of animal, we always expect two solutions. But even though it only crosses one place, this solution kind of counts twice. So we call it a double root. So the reason I'm telling you all this stuff is, on your test, on your homework, on your lectures or whatever, your book or teacher or whatever is going to tell you eventually, solve these polynomials, find all the roots. Tell me if you have any double roots. That's what they're going to say. So you're going to have to be able to, first of all, know how many solutions you expect. And then you're going to have to be able to tell me if any of those solutions are what we call double roots. Double root just means it kisses the axis and bounces right off, but it actually kind of counts twice for reasons that I'll get into in a second when we solve our first problem. It'll be very obvious when you have a double root. But in general, the highest order, the highest degree of the polynomial you have, that's how many uh, answers you get. And in the case where it just barely kisses it, we actually count that as a double root. So it counts twice for the two solutions that we're looking for. All right, now we finally have all that in, uh, in place and we can finally start, start solving some problems. What if I have the function? Um, or I should say the equation, let's say. Let's say we're going to find the roots of, let's call it f of x equals, let's write it in a very easy to write way, x minus 1, x minus 4. You all know that you can multiply this out. When you multiply it out, you're going to get x squared, then you're going to get an outside term, then you're going to get an inside term, then you're going to get a last term. But the point is, is you're going to get an x squared term. So I could multiply it all out, and you would get an x squared term, so you would always expect when you solve this to find two crossing points, two solutions, where this thing is equal to zero. Because the highest power when you multiply it all out is going to be x squared. Don't get fooled and say, oh, there's only x's there. That's the first power. No, you multiply it out. If you were to multiply it out, you would have an x squared term, which means you would have a parabola here. This is a parabola, and you would have two solutions. So if I want to find the roots of this, or if your book might say find the zeros of this, all it means is you set this thing equal to zero. You set the function equal to zero. x minus 1, x minus 4, you set this thing equal to zero. How do you proceed? Well, what you know is that this whole thing multiplied together must be equal to zero. But let me ask you a question. What is 1 times 5? You get 5, right? What is 0 times 5? You get 0, right? What is 5 times 0? You get 0. Anything times 0 is 0. So what we're trying to figure out is what over here will make 
this thing equals zero. Well, it turns out that this is a term times this is a term. If either one of these terms ends up being zero, then the whole thing will be driven to zero. In other words, if x minus one is equal to zero, that means that this whole thing is just zero times whatever, that will give me zero. And also, if x minus four is equal to zero, that means that this whole thing is equal to zero. Multiply by, it doesn't matter what this is, but zero times anything will give me zero. So you see, when you have a factored form like this and you're trying to figure out when it's equal to zero, you just say, all right, zero times, doesn't matter what this is, gives me zero. Zero times, doesn't matter what this is, gives me zero. So I'll set each thing separately equal to zero. Those are the two constraints that will drive the whole thing to zero. So then I solve this simple equation move the one over by adding it, I get x is equal to one. Move the four over by adding it, x is equal to four. So notice, I have gotten two solutions out of this thing, right? I have gotten two solutions out of this thing and you solve both, you circle both of them. So this is probably the first time in math when you've seen that there actually can be more than one right answer. There are two answers to this equation. Whereas lines only cross the axis in one location, you only have one solution, but quadratics, all quadratics, well, I should say all, unless there are these special cases where they kiss the axis like that, they're in general going to dip down or something like this, and they're gonna cross two places. So in this case, it was one and four, so that means the parabola, I'm not sure if it goes like this or if it goes like this, we'd have to graph it, but it crosses at x is equal to one and x is equal to four. Again, we got two solutions. We have a second degree polynomial when we multiply it out, we expect two solutions, so we're done. We don't have to do anything else x is equal to one, x is equal to four. Those are what we call the roots of the function. Also, we can call them the zeros of the function. All right, let me see here. So uh, yeah, I guess I, I wrote a few things down in my notes. If you multiply this out, the function is x squared, outside terms negative four x, inside terms negative x, last terms positive four, the function is x squared minus 5x plus 4. You see how you have a square term here, and so that's why we have two answers. I'm just double checking my notes and make sure. Yeah, you basically expect as many solutions as you have the highest number of the exponent in your function that you have. And that's why when we have a line, we only expect one solution because the highest power is just x to the first. It means we only have one crossing point. Now let's move along and calculate the roots of the following function. Let's say we have the following function, f of x is equal to t plus two, uh, t minus five, right? And I, wanna, I want to find the roots of that. An alternative way that you might see in your book, right now I'm talking about roots, your, your book might just say, here's an equation equal to zero, solve the equation. It's exactly the same thing. Whether it's a function that I then set equal to zero to find the roots, or if I just give you the equation equal to zero, then you solving it exactly the same way. You know that to make the zero, you have two constraints. T plus two has to equal zero, but also T minus five could also be zero. That's two different ways to make the answer go to zero. Move to the negative two over, making t is equal to negative two. Move this over by adding it, t is equal to positive five. You have two answers. And notice the answers you get, negative two and negative five, exactly makes sense. I expect two answers because if I multiply this thing out much as I did here, I would expect the highest power to be t squared, meaning I should expect two solutions. Also notice I don't have any double roots for any of these answers because a double root is whenever it only kind of kisses one location here. Here I have two distinct crossing points. So double root, that whole double root thing doesn't apply at all. But very soon we will encounter some double roots and it'll be very obvious when we solve the equation why there has to be a double root there. So let's crank up the complexity a little bit and talk about something like this. What if I give you an equation to solve and it's just like this, t multiplied by t plus one multiplied by t minus two, and I just say, hey, that's an equation, set it equal to zero and solve it. I want you to tell me the values of t that make this equation equal to zero, right? So it follows the same pattern. In order for this to be zero, if t is equal to zero, it'll kill the whole thing. If this is equal to zero, it'll also kill the whole thing. And if this one's equal to zero, it'll also annihilate and kill the whole thing, which means I have three different ways to make this zero. I have t is equal to zero, that's the first one. 
And then I have t plus 1 can be equal to 0. That's the second one. But I can also have t minus 2. That can also be equal to 0. And in order to get anywhere here, I have to move this over making minus 1. And I can move this over equal making positive 2, just adding it to both sides. So here I actually have three solutions. Three solutions uh, for this guy. Why did I get three solutions? It's because if you think about it, if I cover up the t and I multiply this out, what am I going to get? The highest power will be t squared. Then I'll have some other terms, but the highest power will be t squared. If I take that thing that I have and then multiply it by another t, then the highest power will be t cubed. And I told you already that you should expect the number of solutions, number of roots, or number of solutions to this thing to be equal to the highest power of your polynomial. So this is really a third degree polynomial. So we expect three answers and we indeed do get three answers. They're all different answers. So we don't have any double roots. They're all unique and distinct. And so I think it's useful to see what this might look like. I don't want to draw a detailed graph, but I want to draw a quick little sketch just to show you because you're probably curious. If this is t and this is f of t, what would this graph look like? Well, we know we have special points at minus one at zero here, and also at here's one, here's two right here. These are the special points. So we know that the function has to be equal to zero at these points. So what does it look like? The function looks something like this. It's just gonna be a sketch, so forgive me, it's not gonna be perfect. It's gonna go up like this, then it's gonna go down through like this, then it's gonna switch back up, and it's gonna go up through like this. So notice that this is not a parabola. Parabolas are x squared, or in this case with a variable t, it's t squared. Anything with a t squared is the highest um, power of, of your polynomial will always look like a parabola. But this is not a parabola because it's not t squared. When you multiply all this out, your highest power will be t cubed. t cubed, or cubic functions is what we call it, always kind of go up and then down and then back up again, giving three distinct crossings. Here at negative one, here at zero, here at two. So by graphing it, if you were to plug it in and graph it, you can see the crossings, but even without the graph, you can calculate the zeros of the function or the roots of the function simply by setting it equal to zero and solving it. All right? So essentially, now you can understand why factoring was such a big deal. Because here in a little while, see, I've been giving you all the functions in the already factored form, but here in a little while, I'm not going to give it to you in factored form. You'll have to factor it yourself and then solve it which is why we spent so much time factoring, because you can't do that. You cannot solve these equations without knowing how to factor things. So the next thing we'll do, I only have um, one, I think two more little things I want to cover here. Um, and the next one is very interesting, actually. What if we have um, s minus 1 squared multiplied by s minus 3 squared equals 0? How do I solve that? If I just say, hey, I want you to solve this function. Well, the first thing you want to do is realize that you've never solved an equation like that before, so you probably should take it step by step and think about what you're doing. What this means, s minus 1 squared, really means s minus 1 times s minus 1. That's what s minus 1 quantity squared is. And then the s minus 3 is here multiplied again by s minus 3 because it's times itself. And we're saying that that's equal to 0. Now let me ask you a question. Before we even get to the answer, how many solutions do you think will actually happen here? Well, when you think about it, if you were to multiply all this stuff out, if you were to multiply these, you would have a polynomial in s squared. And if you multiply these, you'd have another polynomial in s squared. So the highest power from this multiplication would be s squared, multiplied by another polynomial with the highest power of s squared. So when you do all the cross multiplication, the highest power will be s to the fourth power. So this is actually not a quadratic parabola. It's not a cubic function, which is a power of 3. This is a power in s to the fourth. I've just kind of hidden it here by the way it's written. But if you multiply it all out, your highest power will be s to the fourth. So you should expect four crossings or four solutions, unique solutions. For, I shouldn't say unique solutions, but four solutions. Let's see what we get. If this is equal to zero, it'll kill it. If this is equal to zero, it'll kill it. This is equal to zero. If this is equal to zero. There's four different ways it can happen. So we'll write them down. S minus 1 is equal to 0 from this one. S minus 1 can equal 0 from this one. S minus 3 can equal 0 from this one. S minus 3 can equal 0 from this one. So what do we get? We have S is equal to 1 here. S is equal to 1 here. S is equal to 3 here. By moving it over, S is equal to 3 here. So we do have four solutions. However, notice that two of them are exactly the same. The ones are the same. 
and the threes are also the same. So the way you really write it down, instead of saying S can be one or one or three or three, you say S can be equal to one and we call that a double root. You can write the word double out if you want. Um, and then you also say S can be three, you can write that and say double root. This is what you would circle on your test. So what you're saying is that there are only two unique solutions at one and three, but this one really counts twice because it was present twice. And this one really counts twice because it was present twice. So really when you add them all up, you have four total solutions. So you have four total solutions, which is exactly what you expect from a polynomial with the highest power of four. You expect four solutions. Now, I'd like to graph this one really quickly to show you it's kind of crazy looking what it looks like, but to show you that it all makes sense. So if this were the axis here, and we're not gonna do a, a great sketch here, but um, let's say this is S and this is F of S, where I'm gonna plot this function, just take off the zero and I'm gonna plot this as a function, what would it look like? Well, you know the special numbers are at S is equal to one, and at S this is number two, and then S is equal to three. Those are the special numbers where we say, it's, we say that we're crossing the axis there. But what it actually looks like is this. If you plot it, it goes like this. It touches here, then it comes back and it touches here and it goes up like a W. So it turns out that these fourth power functions most of the time look like little Ws, right? They go down, then they go up, then they go down, then they go up. Now, if I could just grab this green line and shift it down, like if I could draw another one, it would go down below, then up, then down below, then up, then I would have four distinct crossings. But in this case, I don't. I shift the function up a little bit because of the way it's written so that it only kisses the x-axis here and it just barely touches again here. So at one and three, I have a root of the function, but each of these count twice. Why? Because when the graph just touches and tangentially bounces off, it counts as a double root. Why? Not just because I'm telling you, but because when you actually solve the function, you have two identical terms here. So really when you solved it, you got two identical answers. That's why it's a double root. Two identical answers, that's why it's a double root. So you'll always know when you have double roots, even without graphing anything, because when you solve it, you'll have identical answers. And you group them together and you say, hey, there's a double root. Turns out, when you get to higher stuff, you can have triple roots. If you have three roots that are exactly the same, you lump them together and call it a triple root, right? But for now, we're just gonna have double roots and we're only gonna actually have one more example here as well but you're getting the gist of it now. You're understanding hopefully why we expect four solutions, we get four, it's just two of them count twice. Last one, I know this is a long lesson, but it's important to get all of this out in the beginning. What if we have this equation we wanna solve? Z squared plus three equals four Z. What if I just gave you that equation? I said, solve that equation. You wouldn't have any idea really what to do because you would try to solve for z the way that you've always learned how to solve before, to isolate it by itself. But it's impossible to isolate it. Even if you move it over, you can't combine them and just divide and get one value for z like you can in elementary algebra. But what you can do is you can move the 4z over by subtraction. So you have a negative 4z here. And on the right-hand side, you're gonna get zero. When you subtract that 4z from both sides, you'll get a zero. Now what do you have? A trinomial equals zero, but it's a quadratic trinomial. We know how to factor those. So anytime you see a quadratic like this, you try to factor it and set it equal to zero. So how do we factor it? We need the first terms to multiply to get z squared. And the last terms have to be one times three to give me three. And I can choose different, you know, plus, minus, we did all that stuff before. The only thing that works is minus, minus. Why? Because Multiplying these two will give me positive three. Multiplying these two will give me the z squared. Multiplying these two will give me negative z. Multiplying these will give me negative three z. I add them, I get negative four z, so that's the correct factorization. Which means this, if I set it equal to zero, uh, sorry, z minus one equals zero, is a valid way to kill this and make it zero. Also, z minus three is equal to zero. So I solve both of these little mini equations. Z can then equal one by moving it over. Z can then equal three by moving it over. So how many roots did I get? I got two roots, or you can call them zeros if you want. Why, does that make sense? Yes, because I had a polynomial with the highest degree of two, so I expect two answers. 
We won't do this for every problem, but let's go ahead and sketch this graph just to see how it looks. If you were to stick this into a computer, z and f of z, and just graph the line, or graph, it's not a line, graph the polynomial, you would have special points at one and at three, right, because those are the points you have, and what would it look like? It's gonna look like a parabola that goes down through there and goes right back up through there. Those are the special two points, we call them the zeros there. So, we've covered a lot in this lesson. I really can't stress how important it is because there are so many applications of solving polynomials. You use it quite a bit in calculus to do other things that we'll get into when you study calculus, but you also use them in engineering, science, math, and so forth. We started the lesson by looking at a line. Lines, in general, unless they're horizontal, are only gonna cross the x-axis in one location. Now you know that we only expect one solution because the power on the x is just a one. So how do we do it? We set it equal to zero and solve. Boom, we get one answer. That's what we expect and we verified that. Then we said all parabolas look like x squared type of deals. Even if they have extra terms, they're all gonna look like parabolas of different shapes and sizes. Most of the time, they're gonna have two crossings, which means two solutions, which corresponds to uh, the um, highest power being two. And what you have to do to find them is you solve those functions equal to zero. You set each individual little per parenthetical term equal to zero, finding the answers, and those correspond to the crossing points. But we also said that if you have higher order polynomials, like this is a cubic when you multiply it out, you expect three answers, which is what we got and what we showed. And if you have a fourth degree polynomial, you expect four answers, which is what we got, but two of them were identical, so we actually call them double roots. In this case, the double root is two times when the uh, equation kind of just touched the axis. Uh, for a parabola, it would just be one location when it touches the x-axis, but it'll be obvious when it happens because you'll see all these duplicates in your answers. And then in general, you will have to factor things yourself in order to set it to equal to zero and get the crossing points. And the last thing I'll leave you with is that sometime down the road when we study this in a little more detail, we'll have some parabolas based on the numbers that consist of, uh, comprise the, the actual polynomial, where they won't have any crossings at all, they'll exist up here somewhere. When you have that physical situation, then you don't have any real roots at all. There's no real crossing because it doesn't go down there. And that is in the realm of what we call imaginary numbers. We'll talk about that much later on, but it's just a preview for that. For now, make sure you understand conceptually what we're doing. Solve every one of these problems yourself and then follow me on to the next lesson. We will continue learning how to solve polynomial equations in algebra and we'll increase the complexity a little bit, but they're all gonna be like this. We'll set it equal to zero, we'll factor the expression, we'll set those little terms equal to zero, and we'll find the roots of the polynomial.